Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I'm excited to speak here at ZeefCon. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but it looks like a lot of the conference attendees are, are having a good time with my colleagues, uh, George Orchias and, and Chris Peacock. So it's been good to at least catch up and see some of those pictures on Twitter. Uh, today, I'm going to get to talk about one of uh, probably the most uh, fun things for me is talking a little bit more about execution methods and diving deep onto the specific topic because I think it's something that's not quite visited enough uh, when we're talking about some of our purple teaming and how we're changing some of what we're doing as we test. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the adversary emulation lead at Scythe currently. Uh, I've been here about a year and a half now. Prior to my time at Scythe, I did security research uh, at Sandia National Labs, did a little bit of everything. I also worked at uh, MITRE, which most people are familiar with because of MITRE ATT&CK. So I worked with that team, uh, the attack evaluations team, and that was really where uh, getting into the sort of open source uh, focus of cyber threat intelligence, as well as tying that to adversary emulation and some of our testing. So I've, uh, I've been around uh, in this space for probably about a decade now and uh, excited to at least share some of uh, what I've been doing over the past couple of years. So three big things that I hope you'll take away from this talk is the first, of course, is why execution methods are a hard problem. It's why they make security challenging uh, because they're sort of the, uh, the ground floor of everything else that we build things on. Uh, second thing would be the mindset for how you can do some tests and depth of testing with different execution methods. We often focus on different types of uh, techniques or, and working across MITRE attack matrix in this instance. And I really wanna focus on trying to drill down on a few specific ones and, uh, and focus our testing there. And then of course, like a lot of talks, I wanna make sure that there's a ton of resources for you to work off of. So regardless of whether you're able to apply this in an enterprise environment or you're a student or someone that's working from home or in your own lab environment, that you still have a lot of different options to choose from when you're trying to learn more about this topic. So what are execution methods? So I took this from All right, let's talk about uh, execution methods. And just to give an example here, uh, let's talk about process discovery. So process discovery is T1057, for those of you that aren't familiar with it. Uh, we There's a bunch of different ways to execute it. And so if you've followed me, you've seen some of this before, where there's tons of different ways to execute it. We've got task lists, get process, you can use other tools. And the difference between all of these, even though they're all tie into the exact same uh, technique, is the execution methods, whether it's command line, PowerShell, WMI, or the Windows native API. And so that's one of the things that when I talk about variance and I talk about depth and execution methods, it's about how we can change those and how, of course, those are going to impact our ability to detect them. And this is how adversaries have been uh, more and more moving towards changing what they're doing. So why do they matter? One of the big things that execution methods give us or give anyone is flexibility and expertise. Uh, this is across, uh, across everything, whether it's legitimate use cases, system administrators, uh, operating systems are designed to have a wide number of use cases and a wide number of users. So when we get to execution methods, just touching on some of the ones we talked about previously, command line was obviously used first for systems administration things like that. We then of course have PowerShell is another big one that came along. And so those are some of the ways that we're able to, uh, that the operating systems are able to sort of meet people where they're at and also provide new features. Well, of course, especially in Windows, providing uh, a lot of old legacy features so that people are able uh, to continue to leverage it. Telemetry inconsistencies. And this is sort of the heart of why execution methods matter. 
is that getting information from each of them is a little bit different. And so being able to write detections relies on that information. And of course, more and more adversaries or red team uh, research is done in order to try and find execution methods that don't have any sort of telemetry or have low telemetry for defenders to work off of. And so part of that is you have to determine the intent behind the action. Because these are leveraging different technologies that are part of an operating system that are there for legitimate use cases, we have people, you have to determine whether or not it is a typical program, uh, just a Windows application that's doing that specific uh, behavior or whether it's an adversary trying to abuse it in a blend end. And then that's where I've been talking about this and the sort of underlying thing is that operating systems offer a ton of ways to execute different code. That's really, uh, and you can install even more, right? And you can continue to extend it. And that's something that I think is, is sort of at the, the heart of the problem is that we have such a large attack surface when we're talking about execution methods because there are more and more ways being invented uh, to execute code uh, to meet developers and technology as it continues to grow. Now, a quick roadmap of what we're covering today. We're gonna go over a quick cycle of execution methods as a whole, uh, how they sort of build on top of each other, we're going to go over a bunch of resources on sort of what you're going to need for testing and tools. Then we're going to dive deep into Windows PowerShell and the different execution method variants you can do in order to sort of thoroughly test it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the LawBass project and MS Build to sort of close it out. Now, the cycle of execution methods. This is something that uh, I picked PowerShell for sort of my main my main uh, examples here, and partially because it's been sort of so well documented and a lot of uh, people in the space have a pretty good history of it. So when we are talking about life cycle, let's talk about how something comes in uh, to being an execution method. Part of it is its creation. And so PowerShell version one was released back in 2006. Now, something to remember though, is that every time something's released doesn't necessarily mean it's used. This it was at a point in PowerShell's life where you still had to download and install it, and then it wasn't as widely adapted. And so that's something that comes into sort of the maturity of each of these different methods is whether or not they're widely adopted. And so when we look at PowerShell version two that was released three years later, it was included in Windows 7 by default. Now having default installs is something that is going to increase your user base by a lot. And that's where we have this intended use of uh, PowerShell through system administrators that now had this tool that was widely deployed by default that they could leverage. Now, of course, the next step is what you can probably guess. The you know information security community always has this part in it. And it's the unintended use of the execution method. And so while these aren't necessarily the, the pure points uh, of where these things turned, right? It's key thing to remember is that research happens before publishing. And so these things typically probably happened even years before the actual uh, talks, but there was a DerbyCon talk that went over PowerShell and was like, oh my gosh. And so that was Dave Kennedy and Josh Kelly back in 2013. And then of course, Empire was one of the big first well-known command and control projects that sort of came out and focused on some of those post-exploitation activities, sort of opposed to uh, Metasploit at the time. And so Cobalt Strike had obviously made some of those, uh, just C2 in general, uh, a big topic, but PowerShell Empire was sort of the first one, one of the first ones that sort of came out that was used uh, widespread. Now with that, of course, comes uh, more and more people abusing these systems in PowerShell. And that is where we get better logging and telemetry from the vendor in this case, Microsoft. And so they had a lot of enhanced logging that they did in PowerShell's version three, four, and five through the Windows management framework. And really the things here that you might be familiar with are, uh, are of course, the script block logging. We're gonna talk about that a lot, like module logging, and then of course the constrained language mode and some of that. So that's really what where we saw this sort of reaction uh, from Microsoft in that case, they released a, an entire blog post about how, you know, uh, PowerShell loves the blue team too. And so you can go check and read through some of that. But the idea was to give defenders uh, an ability to monitor and try and lock down a lot of PowerShell's features. Now, the next thing is of course, people look for new execution methods, whether it's native API calls, uh, when doing that through different methods like C-sharp uh, or some of the other red team research that you've probably seen. 
Um, but the idea behind this entire life cycle is that typically this is how uh, people are going to go through and, and look for things, especially when, when you're talking about adversaries are trying to accomplish a, a lot of similar things, even across time, their methods just change a little bit. And that's really what it comes down to. So uh, this is a compounding problem because things keep uh, adding to it. We're covering, you have to cover all the previous execution methods while also tackling new ones that come out. And so that's something that is challenging for any organization because it means you need people that at least are plugged into some of those communities can understand what are some of the challenges. And of course, this is while development's still happening, right? PowerShell in this case is still a problem uh, even all these years later because there is active development. There are things that you can still use. And so that's where you have to have a team or a strategy for tackling some of those. And of course, if your data changes, whether you're swapping out uh, EDRs or other defensive vendors, this is gonna be something that like makes your challenge even harder, is how do we make sure we maintain consistency in our detections across all these execution methods while adding and taking away tools? So the purple perspective here is that it can be a good thing because execution methods tend to be what we see and talk about when we're talking about adversary maturity. And so this provides defenders with a maturity map for how they can look at their own testing. So you can use execution methods as a way to see what level of maturity you're at. And so from like command line to PowerShell to Windows API calls, and there's a couple in between there too, you can essentially track how adversaries are uh, building their own capabilities and then map that to your ability to not only track, but log and detect off of the behaviors being executed with those specific execution methods. So there is a positive here. Now, how do we solve all of this? Uh, this is, of course, a Purple Team conference, so uh, through Purple Team testing. So let's, next, we're going to talk about different testing methods and tools. So a, a little bit of advice here from somebody who's been doing this for a little while is focus, especially if you're new to doing either purple team exercises or to security testing in general, is to focus on one question at a time. Now, you have to break your big questions into smaller ones, and I've got an example here that we'll walk through. But the big thing here is to pick a technique, and you're not going to deviate from it uh, for this set of testing. If you're testing execution methods, you want to change one variable at a time, the variable you're changing is the execution method and not the technique itself. And so discovery techniques are a really good starting point because they tend to have something that you can execute on, uh, on the endpoint. For instance, PowerShell, command line, WMI, that kind of thing. It might have a one or two uh, command execution where other techniques are going to require a bit more effort. And so for this one, our big question and this might not seem like a big question to all of you, is will process discovery T1057 generate an alert? So let's look at how we wanna break this down. There's a couple of different things we wanna focus on here. One is how do we execute the technique? Uh, we'll get into a little bit about how this can get more complicated, but overall, part of the thing here is making sure that you have the current skills and expertise to execute it. Now for something like process discovery or the other discovery techniques, they're a great way to start because they don't take a whole lot here. Of course, you can execute it. Uh, in fact, a lot of them are used by programs so that it is even going to allow you to execute it uh, through potential uh, protections and those new mechanisms that Microsoft's put into PowerShell. The other thing, and this is going to be where uh, it's gonna take some time, effort, and energy is what artifacts are generated on the endpoint in this case. Uh, by what you're executing. In the course of process discovery, it'll depend on how we're executing it, but this is where you need to at least be thinking of what are some of the things that happen when I type in that command? And then of course, what changes can you make that would potentially impact that uh, alert? And then going over to uh, what is probably a little bit more on the detection side is where are you gonna get your data? What's that data source you have for your execution method? Uh, and of course, being able to correlate that with other data, this gets more into that last point, which is analysis and how much you want to be able to do versus being able to just see that you have the data that you're collecting. And depending on where you are in this, in sort of your own testing maturity process, you might not be able to answer all of these and that's okay. I just want to at least put these out there as this is a way that you can break down that big question into smaller ones that you need to tackle individually. Now, our testing setup is going to have three key components here an environment, 
Uh, and of course, using something like the cloud is, is what a lot of testers are moving to, at least for standing up test beds. And I'll talk about those a little bit in a minute. You of course need to collect data from that environment. And so data collection tools, some of them are, can be built in, other ones are specific projects. And then of course, the last thing is our data generation. And that's really how these things break down. We oftentimes think of it in red team tools or blue team tools or things like that, but at its core, that's really what we're doing in an environment is we're trying to generate data for us to work off of. Now, test environments, if you are working uh, at an enterprise, is ideally your production environment because you want all of that noise, you want all of those things in play because you may find out that the execution method you're testing is used all across your environment and that is going to make it really difficult in order uh, to write detections uh, just in a vacuum if you're in your own test bed. Now, if you're not, of course, doing able to do it in your own production environment, there's a lot of other options and these continue to grow, which is actually great because it provides a lot of opportunities for more and more people to, uh, to learn about how, how enterprise networks work and how testing can work in them. So virtual machines, cyber ranges, that kind of thing, cloud providers, as I already went over, are sort of those key, uh, key components when you're looking at building uh, different test environments. Now, I've got a couple here uh, that I'll, I'll talk to. Attack range by Splunk. This has been a really popular one that's continued to grow and be supported. And this sets up sort of everything for you. Uh, so this sets up your data collectors. This sets up your, uh, uh, your data generators and of course gives you the environment. It does require a combination of virtual machines and cloud infrastructure. So this is one of those, you know, bring your own credit card uh, in order to set, set some of this up. And that's when we're talking about these cloud environments, a lot of times that is what you have to do. You're setting up the environment in your own personal cloud account. So you can do testing, but I would say watch out for that bill uh, at the end of the month, because there's a lot of stories online of people that forget that they leave something up and then uh, have a lot of money that they have to spend. Game of Active Directory, this was also recently updated by Orange Cyber Defense. They released version two. And so this is a intentionally vulnerable Active Directory setup. And the idea behind this is looking at the, the types of environments you wanna test on and the types of execution methods you wanna test. Active Directory could be a key component to some of that. So setting up some of these ranges allows for it. Detection Lab is another really popular one that came out by Chris Long. Uh, and this is has, a it's probably the most censored environment out of everything here. And that's something that of course people have used if you are trying to figure out exactly what artifacts get generated. Now, if you've never used it before, a, a word of caution here is that if you start doing too many uh, things at once, you're gonna get a flood of data and you're not gonna know necessarily what to look for. So again, keeping your testing small if you're using Detection Lab for the first time is gonna be key. Now there's uh, Snap Labs, which is now part of Immersive Labs, uh, also has Active Directory ranges. They have a community edition where you again can plug in your own credentials and they will, uh, they essentially have all of these, a lot of these things templated out. So you can just click deploy and they'll, they'll host it on your own infrastructure. So it's kind of a cool way to set it up. And then uh, the last thing here is a book and that's uh, Building Virtual Machine Labs, a hands-on guide by Tony Robinson. And this walks through, if you've never built virtual machines before, or you're just interested in learning more about the depth that you can customize and how you can build some of these environments yourself. That's a good uh, starting point. Now let's talk about data generators. These three questions are the big things that uh, I already talked to earlier. And the first, the first and last are gonna be your big things here because how to execute the technique, just knowing how you're able to execute it with that tool, as well as what changes and customizations can you make? It's not always something you're gonna be able to, there's, there's changes that might be limited because of how the tool's built. So that's something that you've got to think of, or at least, uh, test out and try out when you're going through your testing. Now, there's a bunch of different ones. I'll give a shout out here to the C2 matrix. That's sort of an aggregation of a ton of different projects. Uh, SANS also released a Slingshot VM. That's a C2 matrix edition that has a bunch of those uh, command and controls automatically set up for you because some of them do take builds. And then you can just work from that. So sort of ease of deployment, that might be one way to do it. Now, Atomic Red Team is probably the most well-known data generator because it is probably the most straightforward to, to use. Although something to uh, mention is of course, uh, if you're not, if you're just using Atomic Red Team and sort of copy pasting off of that, or use, you may not generate network traffic, which might be something that is again, important to your detection for your execution method. 
Caldera by Miter. It's another big one. That's a, a personal project that I, I really like uh, because I worked on it some while I was at Miter and it was sort of uh, um, something I really enjoyed. Uh, Purple Sharp. I think Mauricio talked earlier today and maybe even highlighted Purple Sharp some. So I'll give a shout out, uh, shout out to him and to the project there. It's another one to check out. And then to continue on with a book recommendation, uh, there's Black Hat Python and Black Hat Go uh, by No Starch Press walk you through how to create a command and control framework with either Python or Go so that you're able to see exactly how things work and you are essentially writing some of the code that's going to do that data generation. So depending on what level you're trying to learn, whether you're trying to just get something uh, done quickly or build your own, there's a whole bunch of options here. Pick one or two and try them out. I think that's more important than trying to pick the perfect one. Now data collection, again, we went over these uh, and this is just to understand how are you going to be getting this data that you're, you're testing in. And so there's a couple of different things here. If you are in that production environment, an EDR or other production tooling are going to give you a lot of data already. Now, if you're missing some, it might be as simple as turning on a feature instead of having to install something completely new. Uh, and this is where I mentioned before that for lab environments, leveraging a detection lab or attack range is something that will automatically instrument it for you. Uh, so it has a bunch of sensors already. They also, on the pages for the projects, give you a list of the different technologies. So that's something that you can, of course, uh, leverage. Now, if you're building your own or if you're working in your own work environment, everyone talks about Sysmon, and Sysmon's great, uh, but a lot of organizations still haven't deployed it widely. So EDRs essentially use uh, similar collection methods to it, so it's a, it's a good way to at least get started. And of course, these are the two major recommendations, Swift on security and then Olaf's uh, modular Sysmon project are both really, really good places to start if you haven't used Sysmon before. So, and then the last thing I wanna talk about here is of course, network data. This is something that a lot of what we're gonna talk about and test on is the host, but network data can become a key element when you are uh, writing your detections in your environment. So this is something that it's going to depend on what sort of insights you have. And this is going to be your, your mileage may vary depending on your setup. But as you are maturing and learning more about this, if you are building your own test bed, linking and correlating both the host-based uh, information and the network base is going to be key. And so you have the Zeek project is one of those, uh, formerly Bro. And then of course, this is something I just like to talk about the data collectors because the Elk stack is pretty popular. And so you have all of the beats. Uh, so WinLog beats is one, one of those data collection methods. Now, as far as when you start maturing and get to the point where you're beyond data collection and you want to do some of that analysis, uh, the key question here is what data can you group together? That sort of improves your analysis or might allow you to make, uh, make a detection that says this is for sure malicious uh, or reduces the false positive rate that you have to deal with. And so that's where you enrich the data that you already have. Maybe uh, it's a specific uh, process that executes and then is paired with network data. So you understand at least what, what is that host name or uh, URL that it's calling out to. Those types of things can give you more information than something uh, that's sort of isolated and by itself. Now there's a couple of things here. Uh, Security Onion is a big one that's, that is very popular. And then the Elk Stack, as I mentioned before, is something that has been built on a lot. And so I'll give a shout out to, uh, you know, we've seen the Elk, um, although I put the Sans Elk Stack because it is more uh, recently updated. And then I wanna give a shout out to Outflank for Red Elk, which is sort of uh, a red team view of the Elk Stack and sort of doing some of that offensive monitoring which I think uh, this was sort of the first time that that came out, that uh, a project came out publicly that talked about doing some more data analysis uh, for red teams, which I think is really good. So that's why I wanted to highlight that specifically. Now, alert generation, this is where things start to, uh, there's not as many free resources out there. Uh, EDRs have varying degrees out of the box. It just depends on the vendor and your setup. But Sigma has become a massive project uh, by Florian. Uh, and so that's something I just want to give uh, a shout out there. And so you can also port those Sigma rules to other formats. And he also has built his own EDR that has a community edition. So you, that will tell you at least what Sigma rules you triggered with some of your uh, different testing. 
And then uh, Elastic has actually released their detection rules, and those are also widely available. So when we're talking about detections for some of these different methods, we want to look at uh, look at those. Now let's dive. Let's start diving into how you would test something like PowerShell. Uh, and PowerShell is still a problem, as I mentioned in 2022. Uh, the way we're going to execute it for this test and sort of talking through it is with get process through atomic red team test number three uh, and so i've got links there at the bottom if you wanted to try and follow along but the key thing here again is now we know how we're executing it following through all of those questions looking at how are we going to get information from that execution method well we have sysmon installed so we have sysmon event id one so we're going to be spawning a new process as well as having something like script block logging uh, which might be overkill for this specific uh, technique, but it's important because of some of the things we're going to do a little bit later. And then looking at this, sort of asking ourselves the question is, what pieces are missing? Uh, you know, do we have process trees? If this is something that this is the first time you're you're looking at it, process trees are going to help you a ton because it's going to you're going to understand what artifacts are left on the system. And so Process Explorer from the Sys Internals project by Windows is really good. And so this is one of those things where, you know, opening and executing uh, something from uh, from just Windows GUI might have Explorer as a parent process versus something that's not a beacon.exe. And so this is where you'll see the differences between something like Atomic Red Team versus a C2 framework. And you should be able to test out those differences and at least spot a couple of key ones. And something that people that are that are looking at this always ask, should we just disable PowerShell? It seems like a problem. Uh, and I'm gonna say probably not. Uh, maybe you can in your organization, but more and more people still continue to use PowerShell. Uh, and there's this guide that was released on keeping PowerShell security measures to use and embrace in order to make sure that it won't be abused. And so this was released um, by a joint set of governments. Uh, I think all the five eyes. So let's talk about once you've executed that, we've maybe gotten some detections, uh, you know, are you done? And the answer, of course, is no. This is where we're actually just getting started. And there's these are the key variations that you want to focus on for execution methods. And you can probably come up with some other ones as well. But these are the ones that have historically sort of been used by attackers or researchers in order to bypass different techniques. And so some of the key questions we want to look at is like, can we run something without it being logged? Can we obfuscate what we run so that even if somebody is able to collect it, they, they have to maybe do some analysis of their own to determine what it even does. Can we copy and move it? Can we rename? And can we bring our own? There's a bunch of different things here that you can test out. And really what this is, is you're exploring the features and capabilities of your execution method. That's really what it comes down to. Some of them like PowerShell are pretty well documented because they've, they've been around for a long time now. I mean, PowerShell has been around since 2006, as we said. And so that versus maybe the newer execution methods that might not be uh, official even are going to be really poorly documented. And so that might require a lot of research and discovery uh, on, on your own or with a team. And then this also is testing your assumption about how that method works. And as you'll see with PowerShell, there's a lot of things that uh, variations that essentially came out from people testing uh, testing their assumptions. Now let's talk about running something without being logged. How would we tackle this? Um, now remember when I was going through our cycle here, PowerShell didn't start getting really good or better logging and controls until versions uh, 3, 4, and 5, which came out a bit later. But PowerShell version 2 was installed by default for backwards compatibility up until I think last year. And even now, a lot of different laptops or uh, Windows machines that get shipped still have version two enabled. And so this is something that you can do a downgrade attack. And this is where you just tack on that you want version two, you're gonna run the same thing. And this is before all of that logging happens. And so that's something that uh, this still happens in a lot of environments, especially when we're doing purple teaming, we see this a lot. Um, the other thing is truncating logging. This is something that environments, and especially if you're in an enterprise that's trying to conserve the amount of data that they're storing, uh, especially depending on how you're storing it, maybe in the cloud versus on-prem. And so they might truncate to uh, the first 500 characters of something and figure that they can that's all they need. And so in this case, you could just put and prepend 500 spaces before your, uh, before your test and see 
am I able to still see that? Uh, now, this is where uh, it's some things like script block logging might have that minimized command that we'll talk about that, that get past this, but these are still a lot of different good variations to prove whether or not those are working or not. And so that's really the question to ask every time after you run one of these, does my telemetry change? Does my detection ability change or my alerting, which is really what we're trying to work towards. Now, can we obfuscate when we, what we run? Base64 encoding, this is something that's very much inbuilt and part of PowerShell and is widely used for legitimate use cases too. And, uh, co encoding commands in general is something that uh, a lot of, especially automation and provisioning tools use uh, just to help make sure they're, they're getting everything consistently across the network. And this is why uh, Base64 encoding is, is so popular also with adversaries is because encoded commands require at least one more step of analysis, whether it's just decoding it uh, before you try and understand whether it works. So you can check that and see whether or not you have an analyst that's either going to, maybe the EDR does it for you, or maybe you have to pull up CyberChef or something like that in order to decode the command to understand what it does. Now, Invoke Obfuscation is another one of my favorite uh, projects to talk about, uh, and that's by Daniel Bohannon. And this is where he sort of took to the extreme some of the uh, obfuscation techniques that you can do with programming language because you can insert null characters and things like that, and the compiler or the uh, interpreter will ignore them because that's it's just trying to get at uh, what is that thing you're trying to execute. But of course, us looking as humans looking at it, uh, this and this is an example where you can at least still tell what's going on. Uh, you can see, all right, it's get process, but that might break some detections that are based on just looking for a get process string. Other things, how about copy or moving the PowerShell executable? We've we've been assuming that we're using the system uh, path that's executing PowerShell.exe, and so. What if we could copy and move it to just the user profile that you have and execute the same thing? Is this going to break any policies or detections because people are looking for that specific path of PowerShell.exe? And so again, these are some of those variations you have to think through. And especially when we start getting into other execution methods, these can break a lot of what are sort of fragile detections in the area. Same with renaming. Uh, this is something if people are looking for PowerShell.exe, maybe they decided that regardless of where it's executed on the system, if you find PowerShell.exe, you need to detect on it. And this is where rename, of course, is going to get past that. So every environment and every set of detections that have been implemented are probably going to be different. That's sort of the reality. There's some people that can take all of Sigma rules or part of Sigma rules in addition to their own custom rules or what they have in the EDRs out of the box. But these are what you're testing is all those assumptions about what work in uh, in environments. Now let's talk about unmanaged PowerShell, which is sort of uh, works by, uh, it was it was initially sort of coined by Lee Christensen uh, in 2014, had the unmanaged PowerShell project. Uh, PowerPick became in Cobalt Strike, so it was really easy to swap over. I think uh, Empire also supports this. Of course, now it, it does. But the idea with this is that typically your normal PowerShell uh, execution, and this is sort of a simplified version, uh, was calling was run through PowerShell.exe and PowerShell would then reference a DLL. And so the idea was, let's just skip using that exe altogether and call the DLL uh, straight. And that's something that broke a lot of detections and still continues to break detections. Uh, because people are focused on building detections around that PowerShell executable. And so that's something that uh, this, like I said, still is a problem uh, to this day for a lot of organizations is dealing with unmanaged PowerShell. So I uh, highly encourage people to check things out. This is where, of course, when we get to, uh, when we talked about choosing a tool that allows you to have these level of variances, some things are going to be changing just those characters. Others are going to be changing that underlying method in this case but it's still PowerShell. So this is still uh, in MITRE ATT&CK, the PowerShell execution still falls under this. So the other things, of course, and this is going to get to uh, sort of the more advanced uh, variants is can you bring your own? And so this is where can you download and, and bring uh, or upload, I guess, as part of your attack, your own DLL and reference that. So that's something that if people are looking at the different 
paths and say they're looking for everything that's PowerShell.exe and that system uh, automation DLL, you could of course rename it and it's still going to retain all of the features and functionality and Microsoft signature uh, because you download and you're going to be using it uh, the same as anything else would. So if you bring your own and reference it, people might have to figure out what you're calling updater.dll and they are either going to have to uh, try and look for artifacts that indicate that this is a PowerShell DLL or they're gonna have to potentially reverse engineer it or something like that, or they just won't know. And then the last thing is taking that one step further uh, because what we've seen is a lot of organizations will have a, a set of allow listed DLLs uh, or uh, by uh, hash or they will do hash blocking. And so of course, changing the hash on files is pretty easy. But the key thing here is to change the hash while maintaining that signed Microsoft signed binary status. And so that's where there's a project uh, by Mr. Unicoder that uh, is called Windows Signed Binary that will tell you which bytes uh, you can change in some of these DLLs or other uh, execution methods that are signed by Microsoft without affecting that specific uh, signature. So you'll still have you know, a signed binary and it still works, but it won't have that hash. So just ways that you can continue to sort of scale up what you're doing. Now, a couple of additional resources, BC Security forked Empire after it was sunset by SpectreOps a number of years ago. They added a GUI called Star Killer, and that's one additional resource when you're specifically looking at PowerShell. Uh, now, SpectreOps also deprecated and released their uh, free adversary tactics PowerShell course. Check it out if you want. There's a lot of good exercises, labs. All of the slides are there too. Uh, and it's a four-day class. I took it back in 2017. Uh, and so that was, it's a good class. I still recommend checking it out. Now let's talk about Lolbass uh, here to sort of wrap things up. Uh, this was start off as living off the land binary, so lol bins, and it was initially coined by, by Matt Graber and, and that team. And a lot of the early public research was done by Casey Smith. So I just wanted to give, especially Casey, a lot of shout outs because if you go through the lol bass project, you'll see a lot of references as, with Casey as the contributor. And it's great in sort of listing all of those Microsoft signed binaries that allow you to execute something else. And so that's what I couldn't, you know, couldn't do it justice better than what they already had in the GitHub. Um, and basically the idea is there's unexpected functionality that might uh, be useful to a red team or threat actor. And that's something that uh, we're gonna dive into a little bit more. And part of the reason I want to dive into this is because it challenges some of our assumptions with that first question. Uh, with PowerShell and what we chose this last uh, for the, our last example, it's super easy to execute that in the command line. But executing payloads for MS Build, if you've never done it before, is something that is going to require a little bit more effort. So what you see at the top there, that top blue bar, is going to be what you see with the LolBass project. It says what those specific uh, that LolBass can do. It can, in this case, execute, and it's an application whitelisting bypass. And so uh, while MS Build is not on Windows uh, out of the box. It tends to get installed, even if you don't mean it to, uh, because of other applications that are either building or installing things on, uh, on the endpoint. So even if it's not there, uh, or if you, it shouldn't be there, it, it might be there. Now, the other thing when we're talking about variants that, we're talk what, that I didn't touch on before is 32 versus 64-bit versions. And that's something that you can see here, there is that variance in the two. So again, you have different executables in this case or different file paths that might impact your detection. So make sure to look at that. And of course, it's going to impact your ability to execute payloads because you need to tailor your payload to the version of uh, MS Build. So one of the things is that I mentioned before that's going to be more difficult to pay on your technique is, is how to execute it. And you may not have the expertise right now, like just sitting there to be able to execute a MS build uh, one. And so that's where I wanted to at least touch on something that's a little bit harder in order to, to build up tests. And this is where the LawBass project does give you a bunch of examples of how to execute them. And there are all other blog posts. Uh, tools like Metasploit will help you build that initial payload. But again, this is where I emphasize making sure that initial payload only tests, uh, you know, in this case, like the get process technique uh, so that you're still testing your execution methods. And so this might take you some time to figure out what you're doing, 
but that is normal. You're going to have to uh, figure these out before you can even start doing those variances that I talked about for the execution method. You're going to have to figure out how to execute it. And so that's just something I, I want to you know, address because as you get into the more complex techniques, you're going to have to spend some research time to even get your initial test case going. And that's something that, especially if you're new to this, might be a frustrating experience. I know that everyone goes through it uh, at one time or another. Now, again, that those variations, can we move it? Can we uh, run it a different way? These are things that you should explore with every execution method. And this tends to break a lot of the detections, especially when we're talking about wall bass. Um, so PowerShell has been something that with newer versions does tend to be pretty well uh, documented. So it's really about uh, figuring out what is your uh, threshold for risk and what types of adversaries do you think are going to be targeting your organization? Because the more advanced they are, the more they're going to be doing some of these variations because adversaries don't want to rebuild capability. They really want to focus on uh, minimal effort in order to get, have that maximal gain. And that's why they tend to choose and change out execution methods rather than entire new techniques. So there are also a you know, bunch of different detections listed on the Wall Bass project page. I heavily recommend you check those out because I think that's sort of a key, uh, a key part of this. Uh, correlation is really needed uh, for these. This is where I talked about those network connections being key. Uh, you know, my, my uh, historic example here is Meterpreter from Metasploit uh, tend, tended to spawn notepad.exe calling back on uh, port 4444. And so that's something that if you saw in your network, you knew that was, that was probably a malicious uh, actor or tester. And that's in that case, something that takes correlation and context with notepad probably shouldn't be calling out to the internet. And same with you and your environment, trying to understand what are some of those low bass techniques, should they be calling out to the internet or spawning network connections? And if not, that's probably a good place to start for your detections. So there's always more, there's a ton of different ones. I've only covered, uh, you know, uh, really two big ones here, uh, one in depth. And so I would always invite you to go and do some of your own research to explore some of these because that's how you're gonna find new and uh, undocumented ways uh, that haven't been discovered yet. So uh, check them out. There's a lot of good research out there being done. Give another shout out here to uh, MBSET for also doing a lot of good research. And they've got some great blogs that, that give a technical breakdown on how you can do some of these things. So with that, I uh, hope you took away at least what made these uh, challenging as a test, uh, test part, just how you can go and sort of do some more in-depth testing of execution methods. And of course, um, there are a ton of resources here, so hopefully you picked up at least one new one uh, or at least have a couple of things that, that you can try out uh, later. With that, thanks so much.